Welcome to this interview with RJ Pittman, CEO of Matterport. Now this is one of a number of interviews that I'm gonna do here on Asymmetric Investing. So if you want more content like this, please subscribe to this channel, it really helps out. This is an excerpt of this interview, but if you want the full interview, I will put a link to that in the show notes here on YouTube. Thanks so much for watching and now on with the interview. Help me understand the technology journey and what you're capturing today and what you can do with that, that, that isn't necessarily just something anyone can do with an iPhone, because I think there's analogies in like the camera space, right? People are spending thousands of dollars on cameras, even though you have a camera in your pocket. Yeah. I'd say one of the most unique things about Matterport's technology, I would also say that's the most challenging feat to overcome if you want to be a, a player in this space doing what Matterport does. Buildings are very unique. They're as individualized as human DNA. There's really no two buildings that are the same. The layouts, the designs, the volume, the architecture, commercial properties, industrial, residential, high rises, hotels, so vastly different. And for a company like Matterport to exist, much less be successful and get to scale, you can't have a technology that does a great job of creating, let's say a 3D model or picture of the room you're sitting in and just that room. You have to be able to build a technology that is really, really good, if not great, in any setting, any building, any space that you drop it in, it has to deliver the consistent dimensional accuracy, the photorealism. And if that building is a 10 story high rise, how does your software connect the stairwells, the elevator mm -hmm. shafts and all the stories and rebuild it back from the imagery you capture on site into a architecturally precise digital replica of the physical space. It's actually never been done before in a pure automated fashion. The way it's done with LIDAR cameras and field technicians is you capture a bunch of data, point clouds, usually this pixelated data or mesh data, 3D mesh data. It's not photorealistic, mm -hmm. but it's highly precise dimensionally and it slices and bits and pieces of a building or a space, which building engineers, CAD drafters, and architects will then take back and hand reassemble to the best of their ability, you know, what each of those pieces, where they all go like a puzzle to give you that 3D model. Matterport's case this is all done in AI, right? We, we've been at this for 12 years now, and we have an engine called Cortex, which, which was an essential innovation and, and breakthrough that allows us to create these 3D models automatically using a deep learning neural network that's been trained on loads of data. And now it learns and trains on all of the data we've captured over the years. We have such an enormous training data library, 38 billion square feet of every kind of building out there. This automated 3D reconstruction is getting very, very accurate, very precise. And the reason we were able to turn this over to a smartphone, or a little 360 camera, the kind of like GoPro action cameras, and turn that into the same dimensionally accurate, full 3D photorealistic model is that we train the AI to predict 3D geometry and predict how yeah. to assemble things together from an even harder source of data, more difficult or limited, which is 2D flat photos off your phone. Once again, you could have a LiDAR sensor on a phone, which they have today, and we fully support it uh, with Apple. You can have LiDAR cameras and such, but that isn't the hard part. The hard part is full building assembly or full campus assembly. If you have multiple buildings scattered across a university or a corporate campus, how do you figure all of that out in software to recreate it exactly as it exists in the physical world? And again, it takes a lot of data and a lot of training and a lot of science all combined together to make that possible. So it'd be very difficult for somebody, even with a breakthrough AI capability or a breakthrough capability in a new phone, an iPhone 20 or something, to be able to imagine just walking into a 300,000 square foot factory and being able to create a perfect digital twin of it, potentially even in this lifetime. And there's just so much that, that goes into it that it's why there, we tend to be not only an industry leader in the space, but we're really the only ones that can do this. And it's given us a great advantage to be able to benefit from the power of AI to just do this in an automated, super cost-effective way. And is that kind of the answer? Somebody, I put out a call for questions on Twitter and somebody asked about 
Gaussian sp splatting, if I'm mm -hmm. saying this correctly. These are this is technology beyond me and nerfs. And I think this is one of those things where when you see a video of these things, and as I look them up, you go like, oh, that seems like it could be disruptive to somebody like Matterport. But I think if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly, is this is the kind of stuff that you're doing and you're it it's it's like you're going from hobby to now we've got to make this a professional tool and you have to take that not just to the next level, but to like an order of magnitude or two better. Is that is that sort of the way to think about it? Yes. And let me give you two two responses to that. First, Gaussian splats and nerfs. There are so many fantastic innovations on the frontier of computer vision, artificial intelligence. Those are two very promising advancements in just the last few years. And what you've probably seen, if you've if anybody has gone to YouTube and just searched for one of those and look for a demo, you could see somebody basically walking through a house or a property in 3D achieved through a Gaussian splatter or a Nerf model. And it's very, very good when you're on the path that that camera walked through to basically get all of the imaging. You veer away from it, try to move to the corner of the room or come at it from another angle that perhaps you didn't walk from when you scan the space. And, and suddenly the magic of the 3D degrades. More than all of that, the question of dimensional accuracy is probably the biggest one. Like you can get this great model, but does it really know the dimensions with enough precision to where this would be commercially viable? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's step one. There's super promising early days. It will work in small spaces and in limited experiences, but very cool. But in the same way that we are, we are not that overly confident, we're not that naive to think that, oh, it, it, it won't have a disruptive effect on Matterport. The same view I took moments after I joined the company when I, and we were powered only by the Matterport cameras, right? And this was at the time, the Pro 2 camera, $3,500 capture device. It's the only way you could get a great Matterport digital twin. And now we have the Pro 3, which is a $6,000 LiDAR based superpower capture device. But what I saw was the potential to be disrupted by smartphone capture or a 360 or consumer type of camera that might be able to get not as good as Matterport, but good enough, right? To be mm -hmm. a low cost alternative that people would might be just as happy with. So rather than just eschew that away, we leaned into it and said, the best way to prevent yourself from being disrupted in a category like this is to disrupt yourself. And so that was at a time when 70% of our revenue was coming from camera sales. And I went out there and said, we're going to make it available with the smartphone in your pocket. You don't need to buy a camera from Matterport. And the subscription tier is going to be free to get you mm -hmm. started. So everybody thought like either RJ's lost his mind. There goes Matterport, a perfectly good company with a great product and solution. Or there just might be something to the madness, right? And what happened when we launched that? Two, two very interesting things. The obvious one happened. We launched this. In May of 2020, about a year ahead of schedule, it wasn't even ready, it was a rough beta, and it was when COVID broke. And we mm -hmm. wanted to get a solution in the hands of realtors and brokers and agents to be able to keep the real estate industry moving forward with virtual open houses for a much bigger audience because they couldn't, they weren't allowed to go into buildings and properties at that time, we were all locked down. In three days, we generated more subscribers on the platform than we did in the first eight years of the company. No surprise, right? We made 3D capture accessible, democratized to anybody who had a phone. The other thing that happened is over the course of the next two years, we sold more of our Pro 2 cameras at $3,500 than we ever had in the history of the company. Why did that happen? Well, that was a very intentional product segmentation strategy, one that I borrowed from my time at Apple. And we have, at the time at Apple, we had all these different versions of iPhones, iPads, and Macs and laptops for a reason right? So that you can hit and meet your customers where they are at different price bands and different performance capabilities of your offering. And we just expanded our market. We didn't cannibalize it at all. And that created an awareness of Matterport and a halo that drove our camera sales, drove the entire ecosystem up, right? And that was the plan all along is to say, we will be capture device agnostic. 